OK, so, um, <clears throat> so I'm going back to eigenvalue solvers. And I'm going to say a little bit about sensitivity and accuracy. And so this is definitely a, a, a more complicated component. So really you know, interrupt me whenever you have a, a question. So <clears throat> whenever you talk about these things, and I actually don't talk about eigenvalue solvers too often, but um, you know, people will come and say, but why doesn't it work? And, and so this, <laughs> this part of the talk really deals with some of those questions, like, I mean, assuming you have good software, right? Why, why do things converge very slowly, or why do they not converge? Like, and what can go wrong? So before we compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors numerically, right, we must understand what we can and cannot compute, or maybe better, what we should not compute, right? So, and, and of course, this doesn't just hold for eigenvalues and eigenvectors, this holds generally, but th this is the topic we're talking about, right? So, so we may want, OK, AX equals lambda x for a, simple, for a single eigenpair with lambda, say, as small as possible, say, minimum I, uh, energy level. And in many cases, right, we want a set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, for, say, i is 1 to m. And m can be large, right? So, so in, in uh, I think, density functional calculations, uh, cone shem, right, you need a large number of them up to some energy level. And then there may be high multiplicities, and you need all of them. So th those things make the problem quite hard. What, is, what do you mean, all of them? Well, so you may have a, you may have a, I guess what you call a degenerate eigen uh, energy level. So you have. If you have a degeneracy, you want. If you, if right. You right. Want all of the eigenvalues less than a certain cutoff. Right. Right. So so if you know if energy level you know e is repeated 20 times, you want all 20 of them. And that can be quite hard, especially with these methods, because you, know, you start with a single, well, okay, if you think of an exact multiplicity, well, if you start with a single vector, <coughs> then in exact arithmetic, all those uh, states get collapsed into one, just to combine, just a projection of this one vector that you start with on the eigenspace that they span, right? So in order, if you want to get all of them, you have to put in some extra work. And of course, numerically, what's really the problem is you know, if they're only a little bit different, right? because then they look like they are the same. Anyway, so, so there are all kinds of additional considerations you need to take into account. It may be important that we do not skip any eigenvalues. Because then, OK, you would skip an eigenvector in this basis for this space, and, you don't, and things go wrong. Um, <clears throat> we may want the invariant subspace very accurately. And we may want every eigenvector accurately. And so those are not the same things, right? So we'll see in a moment that if eigenvalues are very close and it gets more complicated for non-symmetric matrices, then the eigenvectors are very sensitive. So in a sense, if the eigenvalues are sufficiently close, the eigenvectors are simply poorly determined. It has nothing to do with the computer. That's really an essential aspect of the problem. And if you're only interested in the invariant subspace, you don't care. You can compute a nice orthogonal stable basis for that space. But if you want the eigenvectors very accurately, you do care. And so that can be quite hard. And so if it's sufficiently sensitive, right, my statement would be like, well, probably you shouldn't try to compute it because you know, you're not going to get an accurate answer anyway. So you're, you're looking at something that's maybe you you're, may not be posing the right question. Right? So in general, we need to consider the accuracy of a computed answer without knowing the exact answer. Right? That's the problem. So this, and this involves the sensitivity of the result that we want to compute. <coughs> So if a result is very sensitive to small changes in the problem, it may be impossible to compute exactly. And it's important to, to recognize that, right? Because, I mean, what's going to happen if you try to solve that problem is that your, math, you know, your solver may simply not converge. But you know, it, can, it, it may fail to converge for various reasons. You don't know why it's not converging, right? So that's something that may require uh, extra work, but if you know this in advance, right, you can write essentially a better, a better solver that takes this into account, right? In other cases, the results may be computable, but at a very high price. <clears throat> and in, like I said, in, in some cases, it might be better, now that's easy for me to say, of course, right, but it might be better to maybe go back and think about your problem and compute a result that will give you the same answer, but it is less sensitive, right? That, well, that may not always be possible, but if it is, right, it helps a lot. Um, and just, well, just to give one example, as, I, as you'll see in a moment, right, if you have eigenvalues that are very close, the eigenvectors are very poorly determined. And then so in some of the early codes or methods where they were trying to compute all the states up to a certain level, they would just go one by one. So you find the smallest, and you find the next smallest, and the next smallest. But then when, when you hit a tight cluster, you, find, you want to find the smallest. It'll take forever to converge. 
And if you really only need the space, you don't need the individual vectors. If you did the whole cluster at once, it would converge you know, very quickly because that cluster itself may be very well determined, or the space, the, the set of states associated, may be very well determined, but each individually, they kind of mess each other up because they are so close. Right? So, and so you know, people have realized these things, and so there, you know, people have come up with much better methods to do these things. Okay. So we're interested in the sensitivity of the eigenvalues to a perturbation in the matrix. Okay? So different eigenvalues or eigenvectors of a matrix are not equally sensitive to perturbations. So let's, let's look at the simplest case. So how sensitive is an eigenvalue to a perturbation? So if Ax is equal to lambda x, and, and my corresponding, so now I'm also talking about left eigenvectors, right? So, so for every lambda, there's also going to be another vector such that y star a is lambda times y star. So y star is just a complex conjugate transpose, where both of them are unit vectors, right? So y is a left eigenvalue, and so you can call this a left eigenpair. This is a non-hermitian. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also true for a hermitian matrix, but then y and x are the same, right? Right. So this is quite general. Yeah, but in the hermitian case, you don't have to worry about left eigenvectors. So let's assume we perturb the matrix. So obviously now my eigenvector in general will be perturbed in the eigenvalue 2. And I'm just going to do a first order analysis. So I'm going to write this out, throw away quadratic terms. So wherever I multiply something small by something else that's small, I'm going to ignore it. So this is a you know, somewhat coarse but effective analysis. Right? So, all right, so I get a plus e times x plus e. So I can write that out. And then I can throw some things away. Right? So I know ax is lambda x by definition. Uh, I threw away the you know, capital E times small e because that's you know, quadratically small and so on. So I rearrange terms and then I get, okay, so I get here. Um, <coughs> and then I can multiply by the left eigenvector from the left. So I get y star times this thing equals y star times this thing. And I, so, um, so if I write this out, so uh, I get lambda times uh, y star e plus y star e x. So that looks like this, and um, okay. So I can. What I'm interested in is the relative error in my eigenvalue. <coughs> so let me see. What am I doing? Okay. So yeah. So these. Okay. Yeah. So I have this term on both sides, so I can throw that away, and then I can single out this term, right? So I get that <coughs> epsilon is approximately equal to. Okay, y star times the perturbation of my matrix times x divided by the dot product, the inner product of my left and right eigenvector. <coughs> so, so this now has the nature of a condition number, right? It's a constant times uh, the perturbation. So if, two, if a left and right eigenvector are uh, almost orthogonal to each other, right? So this is almost zero. The vectors are, uh, are normalized. So this is almost zero. Then I have a very large perturbation, even for a small e. Right? So, so, okay, so but this tells you two things, right? So obviously for a symmetric matrix, y star x is always 1. So a, a, a Hermitian matrix and a symmetric matrix, the eigenvalues are perfectly conditioned, right? The perturbation of the eigenvalues is of the same order as the perturbation of the matrix. So that's really nice. <coughs> but for a non-symmetric matrix, this can in fact be quite large. So, so eigenvalues of a non-symmetric matrix or a matrix, well, yeah, <coughs> a non-Hermitian matrix, can be very sensitive to perturbations of the matrix. So this is the condition number of a simple eigenvalue. <coughs> if eigenvalues are very close, things get more complicated, and we'll see that later on. All right, so for a symmetric or Hermitian matrix, they are the same, and they are well conditioned. Yes? Were you taking into account degeneracy? I mean, the situation we often have is... Uh, suppose that you have a bunch of degenerate eigenvalues right. And they're degenerate because of a symmetry, but the noise breaks the symmetry and makes it non-hermitian. But right. if you didn't have any noise, it would be hermitian. But the noise can mix the, the degenerate manifold. Right. Well, so, so well, <coughs> okay, if, if, if you wait a moment, we'll get to the sensitivity of the eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors, of course, remain f fairly insensitive because they're well conditioned. But the eigenvectors can change a lot. Now, of course, if, if it's perfectly yeah, degenerate. Y and X there were <coughs> exact uh, yeah. vectors. Yeah, but Not they wouldn't. The noisier. Yeah, uh, okay. exactly. So, but yeah, I think once we get to the sensitivity of the eigenvectors themselves, which, 
which is determined by the closeness of the eigenvalue. So, yeah. so that doesn't go away, even for a symmetric matrix. Yeah. <coughs> OK. So of course, for non-normal matrices, um, so Hermitian matrices are always normal, right? So non-normal means the, uh, well, let's not go there. But in the eigenvectors then are not orthogonal. Uh, you may not even have a full set of eigenvectors, right? So you can have degeneracies uh, in that respect as well that uh, you may not have, for an n by n matrix, you may not have n independent eigenvectors, right? You get what, what are called Jordan blocks and so on. So, so mathematically, it means the algebraic multiplicity. So the multiplicity of lambda as a root of the characteristic equation <coughs> is not the same as the dimension of the null space of a minus lambda times the identity. So that's, that's a much more complicated problem. It's not, uh, so, well, be, especially because computing Jordan decompositions are unstable numerically. <laughs> so so that's, a, uh, that's a problem all in itself, right? <coughs> OK, so a few more uh, expressions here. So if mu is an eigenvalue of a plus e, and lambda, <coughs> there should be brackets there that disappeared. Lambda is an eigenvalue of the, uh, of the, an eigenvalue of a, then, OK, we can show that, OK, the distance between mu and lambda, so there is an eigenvalue of a, that's how you should read the lambda, is bounded by, um, the norm of this matrix, so that's, this is the eigenvector matrix. We're assuming, again, that x lambda x inverse is a. So this is, again, the general case, times the norm of x inverse. So now this can be much smaller than this, so you may not want to always do this, but this is much easier to compute. So this is the condition number of x times the norm of e. I'm going to check. It seems that some of my symbols have disappeared. Let me check if another, I have another copying is better. Okay. Let me quickly run through this <laughs> to see everything looks good. Okay. <clears throat> it looks like only some of the brackets have disappeared somehow, but uh, I can give Amy an updated uh, file. So, all right, so what it means is that, okay, you can find, if you compute an eigenvalue for a perturbed matrix, and of course, in general, what you do is you, you try to solve your problem, and then you get an estimate of what perturbation, right? So, like I said, what you, what you, what you look at, you say, well, I computed the exact solution for a slightly perturbed problem. So what's the magnitude of what perturbation and what may that have done to my eigenvalues, right? So if the eigenvectors are fairly well conditioned, so either your matrix is Hermitian or it's close to Hermitian, for example, right? Then, <coughs> okay, then, then this is a bound on how far an eigenvalue might have moved, okay? And of course, if this is very large, if the eigenvectors have make very small angles to each other, then the norm of x inverse will be very large then, OK, you may have significant changes in the eigenvalues. And so this is one of the problems that can happen for a non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. OK, so a useful backward error result is given by the residual. So this is, again, this is to have an idea about what, what norm of error you're looking at. So if you find an eigenpair lambda x such that ax minus lambda x is this vector r, and this is really small, right, then we know that there exists a perturbation E of norm less than the residual such that this is exact. So, so if you have computed an eigenpair with a really small residual, you know you've solved, you know, you've exactly solved a very nearby eigenvalue problem. And that means that if you know, say, from the background of your problem that the problem is not very sensitive to perturbations, you know you have a good solution. Of course, if you don't know that, or if you know that for some components the system may be very sensitive to perturbations, you may have to put in some extra work. But like I said, if the problem is inherently sensitive, right? There may just be nothing you can do, you know, at least, well, as far as the computer is concerned, you can try to go to higher and higher precision, but, but if the problem is inherently ill-posed, uh, ill-conditioned, then that may not give you, that may not buy you anything. <coughs> okay, so here the sensitivity of eigenvectors. So the sensitivity of eigenvectors is mainly associated with the closeness of eigenvalues. Now I'm going to show it first, it's an easy example for a symmetric matrix, but of course, 
So for a symmetric matrix, it's really how close are the eigenvalues. But for a non-symmetric matrix, it's more subtle because eigenvalues may be far away, but if they're very sensitive, it could still be that a small perturbation of the matrix kind of moves one eigenvalue very close to the other one, and then it would still be, right? You, you get the same problem that is described here. So <coughs> if you think of this matrix, and epsilon 1 is some small number, right? Then, okay, the eigenvectors will be 1, 0, and 0, 1. And of course, if the matrix is in this form, you don't really need to do anything to compute them. But you have to think of matrices that are, you know, general dense matrices, but they have the same near eigenvalues. <coughs> so cons consider a perturbation E that we're also keeping symmetric, right? So in many cases, may not always be the case, but in many cases, if you work with symmetric matrices, you do everything carefully, your perturbations will be symmetric too. Um, <coughs> So we construct a matrix E of, you know, epsilon 1 plus an epsilon 2, and epsilon 2 can be arbitrarily small. Then what I'll show you is that you can essentially see that the eigenvectors can be anything, anything in the, you know, in this two-dimensional space. So I just construct this perturbation so let E1 just be 0, 0, 0 minus epsilon 1. So A plus E has an exact multiplicity. And of course, if I have an exact multiplicity, well, every vector is an eigenvector of the identity matrix, right? So any vector, so after this perturbation, any vector is an eigenvector of A plus E1, right? And then I take, you know, an arbitrary unitary matrix X hat and I add this perturbation to it. So now that comes because I now moved this first eigenvalue away from one again, now they're locked in, right? But what this shows is that if epsilon one is very small, there is a very small perturbation that can turn the eigenvectors into any arbitrary eigenvectors of this two-dimensional space. And of course, if you have you know, uh, a multiplicity or degeneracy of you know, 10, you have a 10-dimensional space in which this can happen. Right? So, <coughs> so as soon as, the, um, soon as you have very nearby eigenvalues or multiplicities, right? well, if you have multiplicities, the eigenvalues vectors just live in a space. You cannot distinguish them anyway. But if you have uh, very near eigenvalues, they, you know, the eigenvectors are you know, this, right, this two distinct eigenvectors, but they are incredibly sensitive. So if you want to compute them accurately, right, of course in this matrix that's not a big deal, but think of any matrix that you apply some uniform, unitary transformation to that has the same eigenvalues, but it doesn't have a structure that tells you what the eigenvectors are easily, right? Anything you numerically would do, like say if epsilon is say close to machine precision, you know, might completely destroy those two eigenvectors. And so in that case, right, it really, there's really no sense in trying to find those eigenvectors accurately, right? Numerically speaking, that has no, no meaning. So a general perturbation result then is not simple. We can do a little bit of work first for an eigenvector and then we'll generalize that and go yet a little bit further and look at a, a whole invariant subspace. Um, <coughs> so the general perturbation result is not so simple. So let lambda x be a simple eigenpair of A. So now, it, it, okay, so by simple I mean that, you know, there is no other eigenvalue lambda of A, right? And now, okay, it should also be clear why I'm talking all the time about eigenvalues being simple. Because if it's multiple, right, everything changes or even if, there is another eigenvalue very close to lambda, well, that'll come out of the analysis, then, uh, you know, it will be very hard to compute x accurately. So, okay, so let x, this be any non-singular matrix. In many cases, right, we'll be looking for capital X to be orthogonal to x, but you don't have to do that. And then, <coughs> okay, why, uh, okay, well, maybe I should not have given them the same letter. So small, small case y and capital Y star is just the inverse of this matrix. So if I multiply that out, right, I get this block diagonalization with lambda as, you know, in the 1, 1 position and m has, okay, so it's a, m, in general an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix and all the other eigenvalues of A are eigenvalues of m, right? So if I perturb this matrix, now I can apply the same transformation to the perturbation, right? So this is like a block diagonalization where I have, you know, a 1-1 one, one block and an n minus 1 by n minus 1 block. So I can apply this to this perturbation. And obviously then the magnitude of those values here can tell me something about how much my eigenvalues and eigenvectors change. Okay? So now we, we introduce, uh, sep, sep stands for separation, right? It's the separation of the eigenvalue lambda from the spectrum of m. So it's a somewhat complicated thing, but if, if you, we think in terms of, say, the, um, the two norm, then we can kind of characterize this relatively easily, right? So if, if we look at the, the two norm, <coughs> then, okay, we have this inverse here. So the two norm of lambda minus m 
inverse, right, would be 1 divided by the smallest eigenvalue of lambda i minus m. Okay. And then, of course, if, if m is symmetric, right, then that's just determined by the distance of the, close, the, the eigenvalue of m that's closest to lambda. But if m is not symmetric, right, then it's something more general. Because then the sensitivity of the eigenvalues in m play a role. <coughs> so the main thing here is kind of the steps through the analysis. You don't have to get all the details out of this. I just want to show kind of what goes in there um, so that, you know, if you have eigenvalue problems that, you know, they converge very poorly or you get results that, you know, from, say, the physics underlying them, you know they can be accurate, right? You, I don't know, you get some wave function that you know just can't be the right wave function. Or you throw it into the, you know, your other, the rest of your simulation and it goes wild or so, right? So, so that you have some idea where this comes from and, and you know, well, what, what you could do to understand it better. And, and of course, if you understand better, you can maybe solve it better. So, <clears throat> so one thing that plays a role is like, how close is this to a diagonal matrix too, right? So, <clears throat> so what's the size of, okay, the off diagonal components relative to the diagonal components, right? So this is this transformation applied to the perturbation and the distance of lambda to m, because this kind of determines how much they, they might be brought close together, right? So this is just some condition that comes out of the analysis. If this is not satisfied, you can't carry through the analysis. But it does show that if those values are small enough and set the, the distance of lambda to m is large enough relative to, you know, these off-diagonal components, then, okay, you still, you, you get results that are reasonably accurate, right? So you get lambda tilde x tilde, so this is your perturbed eigenpair, okay, it's lambda plus some phi, and, okay, x is x plus, okay, x times p, right, x spends the remaining space from, from your eigenvector times some vector p. And you can bound the norm of this. This is bounded by two times, okay, the two one element, that you had here, right? So this, to some degree, determines how far you are from a block diagonal matrix again. Divided, so relative to, okay, the diagonal perturbation and the distance of lambda to the eigenvalues of m, right? So, so if this is sufficiently small, so if lambda is not very close to eigenvalues of the, the, to the remaining eigenvalues, and this is sufficiently small, okay, then p will be small. And if p is small, right, it means your eigenvector is accurate. That's essentially what this is saying. So, <clears throat> so this kind of determines um, the, the accuracy of the eigenvector. And so if, if you know something about, so in many cases, right, if you, if you make some, uh, let's say you've computed A from some other method, and you know what size the errors in A are, right? So this E doesn't have to come from manipulating your matrix on a computer, right? Let's say there are much larger errors in A than machine precision, so it's not the computer that's causing it. But you know where they come from, right? Then you can actually carry out some of this analysis, or you have some bound on the magnitude of E or the coefficients of E. <coughs> and you can certainly carry this out for, say, a model problem, for example. Right? So you can kind of try to get an estimate of, you know, what, well, kind of try to get an idea for what's going wrong, okay? Um, so here are some further bounds that what this essentially gives you, right, is a, if you carry through this analysis, you get a bound on the angle between x and x tilde, right? So, and of course what it says is like, well, if E is very small relative to, now what we have here is lambda tilde, so this is the perturbed eigenvalue, so this is very useful, right, because this is what you actually have. You don't have lambda, you only have lambda tilde. Uh, and we can get an, a bound on the distance between lambda tilde, right? That's just a bound on the sensitivity of the eigenvalue. We already looked at that. So, <coughs> okay, so this gives you some idea uh, on the error in the eigenvector. And, and, tip, and in some sense, in terms, so E may not be direct, well, so typically you have a bound on E, so, so E itself may not be known, but this thing is known, right? And then, okay, the distance of lambda tilde to the eigenvalues of M has to come from some other analysis. So one, one thing you could do is, we just looked at methods that can compute the eigenvalues close to another eigenvalue. So this is one thing you can do. Now, of course, the sensitivity of those eigenvalues plays a role as well. Though if the matrix is, herm is Hermitian, right, and M is Hermitian as well, then, okay, it's just the distance. So you can, there are ways, at least, to analyze. If you have problems with your method, there are ways to analyze this. 
and see what might be causing this problem, right? So in the Hermitian case, right, this is just the distance from lambda to the closest eigenvalue in the, of the remaining eigenvalue. So we were just talking about, uh, uh, well, we, I mean, somebody who came up with a question. <laughs> Uh, why sometimes if you have multiplicities or near multiplicities, and multiplicities typically by noise tends to actually be split apart, right? so they, they'll show up as near multiplicity. Why it might be hard to just compute one of them? Well, this is the reason, right? So if these eigenvalues are very close, it's just, again, you have an inherently ins a sensitive problem. So, so the eigenvectors, which would correspond to the wave functions in this case, right, would be very poorly determined. Of course, at the same time, if there's one only one eigenvalue very close, then actually, if there's some way of, say, other way of understanding what these wave functions look like, you actually know which direction that perturbation is. So, so if you have just a few, um, so based on other knowledge you have about your problem, you might actually be able to maybe to clean them up or do other things with this. Okay, so the distance to the nearest other eigenvalue determines the angle. Okay. So and this is the perturbation of the eigenvalue. So it's given by, again, so you get this y star e times x, and phi was the, you know, the 1, 1 component of the perturbation. Well, let me just go back, right? Um, well, now, of course, if phi is the perturbation of the eigenvalue. That's what you're looking at, um, <coughs> right? So lambda plus phi is your eigenvalue. So what this says is, okay, what could phi be? Well, so phi relative to this y star e x, right, is also bounded by this. So again, <coughs> you, you can kind of, if you know something about the perturbation and you know something about the eigenvector and or left eigenvector, then you can actually make an estimate of what this change in the eigenvalue is. Okay. Uh, and so, okay, the lambda tilde here just becomes then the lambda plus phi. So, the, so this is the perturbed eigenvalue. So, okay, now a little bit about accuracy. So, so what we were looking at was sensitivity, right? So how, how much might things change? And okay, so the, these expressions may give you, I mean, of course this is expensive, but if the matrix is not too large, um, you know, you can certainly do some analysis numerically about what might be going wrong, to just to understand the problem better. Uh, and of course, once you understand the problem, you know, often you can fix it. So a small residual means a small backward error. So a small residual means that you computed an eigenpair or a number of eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a slightly perturbed problem, so a problem very close to the problem you wanted to solve. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate, right? And of course, we do want to often get an, an estimate of how accurate the solution is, right? And why is it not accurate? Well, if your problem is very sensitive, then a small perturbation can give a large change. So if the problem is ill-conditioned, the answer may not be accurate, right? So ax minus lambda x implies that, okay, we solved this slightly perturbed problem, but we just saw if lambda is too close to the remaining eigenvalues relative to this residual, oops, okay, relative to this residual, then lambda x may be completely wrong. So that's kind of, so you need to know if you want to judge like a, a stopping criterion based on the residual, you need to know a little bit about the sensitivity of your problem. Um, and so, for example, some of the standard eigenvalue solvers will simply try to drive the residual to machine precision. I mean, not knowing anything about the problem, well, that's about the best you can do. But, of course, it's also important to realize that that might be overkill for your problem, right? So, you know, the method, if you don't look at anything but the final answer and it doesn't come, right, the method doesn't converge, it might be that, you know, for your problem, you don't need to solve to that level of accuracy. And, and so you can make it converge or converge faster by, by tweaking that. But okay, so, and, and it's important to realize, right, that this is not, in, 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 in this case, if the matrix is really very sensitive, this is not a problem of the method, right? It's the problem of the, the, the well, it's a problem of the problem that you're solving. Um, okay, and okay, so in the Hermitian case, right, it's really the distance of the other eigenvalues to lambda, but, like I said, in the, in the non-Hermitian case, there might be eigenvalues in M that are themselves ill-conditioned, so a small perturbation of M may drive them close to lambda, even though the exact eigenvalue is not. So, so it's more complicated, and that's, you know, it's not always easy to kind of figure this out, uh, you know, what's going wrong. But so these are things that might be going on, and they may keep your method from converging to the tolerance that you want, or the method may converge, but the accuracy may be very poor.
OK. So, so we should avoid defining or coming up with problems that are too sensitive. Now, like in most cases, right, I mean, you're solving a physics problem or a chemistry problem or you know, an engineering problem, and you define the problem in the standard way you know, people define these problems. So, so it's not always obvious that this is the case. But if you really have trouble solving them, and you kind of exclude it that there is a bug in the software and so on, then these are things to think about. And, and so people may find at some point that some problem or subproblem that they're interested in is almost unsolvable. And that might be because there is an inherent problem in, the, in what you're trying to solve. And you really should then look for different ways of approximating the answer that you're interested in. Okay. Okay. And so, so this is what I, an example I mentioned. We want to compute the eigenpairs up to some energy level. And we can expect problems if that selection includes some eigenvalues from a tight cluster, but not all of them, right? So, so if, I, if I put this energy level that I'm interested in, so I want all the eigenvalues below some energy E, and that E happens to be in the middle of a tight cluster, right? It's going to be incredibly difficult to figure that out. And, and of course, you know, some, the methods we tend to use for dense problems, I mean, if it's really too close, it's, it's just a nonsensical question, right? They're not well separated, so maybe you should raise that E just a little bit. But, but in some cases, some of the methods we use for large problems are you know, not as robust as the methods we use for small dense problems. So sometimes what you can do is you say, like, well, let's first put that energy somewhat larger. Then I have a problem that my, you know, these methods like Arnoldi or Jacoby Davidson converges to relatively easily. Then I have a reduction to a much smaller space. And in that smaller space, I can use any of the algorithms Right? So, then, so that might save you. Right? So you first project it on a space where you, you solve a well-defined problem on a slightly larger space. It doesn't give you exactly the answer you want. But then you have more robust algorithms to apply to this small problem. Right? So you may not be able to apply those methods to the large problem, but you can apply it to the small problem. But again, if, if the problem is just too sensitive, that's not going to save you. But sometimes it, it can help. Right? Uh, so the other thing is, if the distance between two eigenvalues is very small relative to the norm of the matrix, in a sense they are numerically identical, right? So there's really no, so you really should think of them as a multiplicity. And, and one reason you should do that is because physically it might be a multiplicity that by some noise has actually pulled them apart, right? So these are things to, to keep in mind. Now, there are some methods, the, and again, these are only for the, the small dense problems, that try to give um, solutions with high relative precision. So all the results I'm giving, actually, we're looking at, at sizes of errors or residuals relative to the norm of the matrix. But if you have like a matrix that covers, say, energy levels from you know, something very small to something very large in, in absolute value, right? It means that if you're really interested in the smallest ones, well, you have a problem, right? Because a small perturbation relative to the matrix would destroy that. And so there are methods uh, that I'm not discussing, uh, and they're, they're only for the small, small dense case, right? Because you need to do a, a number of things. Uh, and some of them are really kind of funny in the sense that you compute some Cholesky decomposition of the matrix, and if that fails, tough luck. But if it works, <laughs> if it works, it turns out you can find all the eigenvalues to high relative precision. So there's, there's kind of really interesting um, things people have done there. So, so and, and, and for the case of if A is really large, right? So there really is an issue, and if you can if you can solve a larger problem that's well defined, that reduce well larger as in taking more eigenvalues, that's well defined, and then using some of those really high accuracy methods that you know that work on the small problems, but I mean in principle they work on large problems too. It's just that you can't do it right space-wise. Um, so that that might then work. Okay, and okay. So again, even if we can distinguish them, their eigenvectors may be very ill-conditioned and so on. So it also depends on really what you're interested in. So in some cases, you may be interested only in the eigenvalues. Well, OK, so then if you have closed eigenvalues, the fact that the eigenvectors are not well determined is not a problem at all. And OK, as I said, more complicated can arise, especially for non-normal problems. Now, you know, I think in, in this group, right, people are mostly interested in permission problems. So, so life is a little bit better. OK. <laughs> Noise is not permission. Okay, so that's, yeah. And it turns out if you make it permission, you make it worse. <laughs> because you perturb things even further, that, right? Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. 
well, I, I guess what it means is you're looking for, you were looking for some Hermitian matrix within kind of the space of the noise around, right, the original matrix, but you don't know how to do that. <coughs> when the generalized eigenvalue problem, mm -hmm. and the noise of the right and left-hand side is correlated, right. if you symmetrize it, you break that correlation. Okay. Yeah, so, <coughs> more interesting problems. <laughs> So, <clears throat> okay, so this for the non-symmetric case, right, if an eigenvalue is very sensitive, a small perturbation may move the eigenvalue near or in another cluster. And so even though originally they were far away, you still get the sensitivity. Okay. Um, so this means it may not be a good idea to compute an invariant subspace that has small angles with another invariant subspace, right? So that's another thing. So, so, so far, and, and for the Hermitian case, that's good enough, right? We, we looked at like, well, okay, trying to split up some tightly clustered block of eigenvalues might be a bad idea, at least if you're interested in the eigenvectors. And so here you have a similar thing, right? So even if the eigenvalues are relatively far apart, but you have two invariant subspaces that make a very small angle, which essentially means you have a, you know, a vector in one space, a unit vector in one space, and a unit vector in the other space, that make a very small angle, right? That would be, the minimum of that is your smallest canonical angle. Um, then the eigenvalues corresponding to those invariant subspaces will be very sensitive, right? So those are other things. And again, you know, for, for an arbitrary, you know, you, let's say you discretize a PDE or you come up with some physics problem, you may not really know these things, right? But, but if you find that you're having a problem, you, this is a worthwhile to start looking at if something like this is going on. <coughs> okay. Um, so some general perturbation results for invariant subspaces, right? So, let, so, so again, the, the methods we were looking at a moment ago, right? We said like, well, I want to find some block surety decomposition with some space, you know, spent by Q1 and then the other space spent by its orthogonal complement and usually we don't compute the Q2, right? So you would be computing a block decomposition of this type where the G was zero. That's what, what, what we were looking for all the time, right? And then we said, well, L1, and the eigenvectors that are in, live in the space x1 is what we're interested in, and the rest we throw away. So that's the first thing you compute. And of course, if you do this numerically, when you plug this in, right, you're not going to get g equal to 0. Again, that's the same thing. But if it's small enough, right, then, OK, you're in business. And what is small enough? Well, I mean, based on what we just saw, right, small enough, for example, might mean that if I know how far the eigenvalues in L1 are away from L2, and let's look, say, let's first look at the symmetric case, right? So G and H then would be the same. Well, up to tra tra transposition would be the same, right? So if, if the norm of these matrices would be much smaller than the distance between the eigenvalues in those two blocks, then you actually know that this perturbation cannot move eigenvalues very close together, and you would know that X1 is accurate so the, the, as an eigenspace, right? <coughs> So, okay, so the range of x1 is an invariant subspace if g is equal to zero. So you may want to know how near is the range of x1 to an invariant subspace if g is not zero, but is very small, right? So, okay, so again, without going into detail, so this is just some analysis. Let P be any matrix such that we can compute x1 hat is x1 plus, okay? So x2 times P, right? So this is just a, some subspace that lives in the space of x2, but your complementary space. And this is just a normalization. And x2 kind of looks like this, um, such that x1 hat is an exact invariant subspace, right? So you're looking for some p that makes x hat an exact invariant subspace of A. And so this is a Sylvester operator and <coughs> for p. So this is how you can solve for p. Uh, no, well, this is the, you, you define this thing for p. Then, okay, we get some set of conditions and they look kind of complicated, so you, don't, you shouldn't try to work this out right now, but you can kind of go backward. I mean, I'll give you uh, two books where this is discussed uh, in, in great detail. So let delta now again be the separation of the eigenvalues of L1 and L2. And again, in the symmetric case, that's just the distance between the eigenvalues. In the non-symmetric case, it's, you know, it depends on the smallest perturbation that can make an eigenvalue in one become an eigenvalue in the other. Okay. So, that, okay, it can be defined in terms of this P, let eta be the norm of you know, this 1-2 uh, block and gamma be the norm of this 2-1 block. Okay, so again, if those blocks, those off-diagonal blocks, are sufficiently small compared to this separation, then we know that such a P exists, okay? And if it exists, okay, and we, we have a bound on its norm. So its norm is bounded by gamma, the norm of G, divided by this separation of the eigenvalues, okay? So, <coughs> 
So x1 and x hat then generate invariant subs. So this tells you for a computed, so this is kind of the other thing, right? So we're interested in, typically interested in two things. Um, given that, let's say we knew our exact eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? How sensitive are they to perturbations of the matrix? Because to some degree that depend, tells us how reliable right, they are or how much sense it makes to kind of compute them. The other thing that you're practically interested in is you compute this you know, Q1 and Q2 or X1 and X2, but it's never going to give you an exact block diagonal or block sure decomposition. So how close should you get to an exact one? Or I mean, you can get up to machine precision, but it might be very expensive, right? So this is kind of the other thing. Given a computed result, how, what can you say about the accuracy of your you know, eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Well, in this case, we're looking at the accuracy of the invariant subspace, right? And then the eigenvalues are perturbed in this way. So I can compute this P, it's bounded by this thing here. So, so I get L1 plus, okay, H times P, H is this 2, 1 block, multiplied by these, and these are, like I said, are just normalization conditions. So, so you, you could, you know, if you make P small, then this is not so large, but then, okay, it blows up here. Um, so this gives, and note that this is a similarity transformation, right? It's I plus P star P, to the power one half times is inverse. So the eigenvalues of this thing are the eigenvalues of this thing. <coughs> and so this is how far uh, the L1 block is perturbed. So if H is very small and P is very small, and okay, the eigenvalues in L are not sensitive, right, then they're fairly accurate. <coughs> and okay, you have the same thing for L2. Now in practice, of course, <coughs> uh, with the methods we were just discussing, right, we would only compute x1. We know kind of x2 because it's the orthogonal complement of x1, right? So, the, you know, we can project on x2 and so on, <coughs> just using x1. Okay, and so here is a general backward error result. So what does it say? Well, if, if I compute my eigenvalue problem, right, so I compute this x1, x2, l1, l2, and so on, and I get a residual, right? So this would be, so typically we would, in these methods I just discussed, right? The, for large problems, you would be ignoring this part. So I, but I have this residual, so I know A times X1 minus X1 times L1 is KR. And this is kind of a similar, right? So this would be for like the left side, so S is this. Then again, if I know something about the separation of L1 and L2, and, and this is sufficiently small, then I can give you a bound on the angle between um, uh, this should be x1 and x, this shouldn't be x2, okay, so I need to, this should be x1 tilde or x1 hat, the perturbed invariant subspace, right, this makes no sense. So I can give you a bound on the angle between the computed invariant subspace and the invariant subspace that is exact. So again, and so knowing something about the, 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 the minimum perturbation that make, would give you a multiple eigenvalue, right, move an eigenvalue from L2 to L1 or the other way around, and the residual will tell you something about this bound. So, so some knowledge of your problem, if you know nothing of your problem, right, you, you have no idea what this is. But if some knowledge of your problem plus R, which, and R is computable, right, this is, I mean, if you use these methods like Arnoldi and so on, typically you get this, or at least it's norm, will give you, will tell you something about the perturbation or the maximum perturbation of your invariant subspace. Okay, so, <coughs> So these are some results that you may want to go back and refer back to if you, know, if you have problems with you know, solving an eigenvalue problem or, or you're getting results that aren't accurate or you want to set you know, convergence tolerances for these methods. <coughs> and um, so two excellent books on, on this topic are both from uh, Pete Stewart. So one is uh, Matrix Algorithms Volume 2 and the other is a book by Pete Stewart and, and well, some classics or are these are recent books? Or? Well, this one is, you know, fairly recent. This is certainly a classic, yeah. Okay. Um, so this one buys by Academic Press, so it's fairly expensive. This one's by Siam, so it's much cheaper. <laughs> it's my guess. I haven't looked at the prices recently, but... Uh, um, okay, well, anyway, so that's it. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> so, yeah, so it's fairly complicated. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, Eric, so once you predict, project them into the subspace, and there are a lot of multiplicities, uh, clustered eigenvalues, do you want to 
so it's the right thing to do to use some spectrum slicing method to kind of deal with those issues? Well, so, um, <clears throat> well, so again, it depends on the, <clears throat> It depends on how how, cluster, how tightly clustered they are in some sense, and how uh, accurate you need certain things. But yeah, so if you have um, if you have eigenvalues that are fairly close to each other, then an eigenvalue solver would have trouble getting them apart. And of course, if they're sufficiently sensitive, like I said, nothing is going to work. But so some other methods that have been tried is the idea that. <coughs> As, as, as we discussed, right, so taking a polynomial in the matrix really applies a polynomial to the eigenvalues. So if you can find a polynomial function, right, that, that looks almost like a step function over a small region, right, then if you would, well, you can't, but you can get very close to that, right? <coughs> and people would use, for example, if, like in the real case, you could use Chebyshev polynomials over the, the real line, for example, to build such polynomials for a specific region of the, of the line then if you would repeatedly apply this polynomial, right, it will send all the eigenvectors that are correspond to eigenvalues where the polynomial is very small to zero, and it will keep exactly those. And, and so those methods can be very accurate. Um, it's somewhat tedious because you have to kind of go block, if you want many of them, you have to go kind of block by block, and you have to tweak that, that window that you want to keep. But, um, but yeah, that would be one way of doing it. But, but like I said, I mean, recent algor there, there are quite a few algorithms that have been rec you know, fairly recently for kind of the small dense eigenvalue problem that are, that are very accurate and that have, well, if everything works, which is not guaranteed, but have this property of uh, high relative accuracy. So, every eigen so if things go well, every eigenvalue will be determined to high relative precision. And that, that's something that kind of just applying the methods we discussed for large problems, you wouldn't normally get. So you'd have to do extra work to get that. <coughs> okay, any other? <coughs> any other questions? Okay, then we'll stop here. Yeah, it's cool. about noon. <coughs> yes, yeah, so we have a, a lunch on your own again. And uh, what we're going to do this afternoon, since we didn't get a lot of suggestions, we're just going to have a, a, a question answer session. And you can ask about topics about Quantum Monte Carlo. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but it will start at 1.15, I guess, or so. So come with your questions. And if you want to. We can even break up into subsections if you want to try to do that. Um, so, okay. See you then. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.